are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Kabinski and I want to welcome you all. It is now 1 p.m. so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today on Friday, May 4th, we will have our presentation on the new market model, making a case for healthy retail strategies, given by Joe Clark and Kara Martin. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. And as you can see, we have quite a few webcasts planned for the next few months. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcast and register for your webcast of choice. We're also offering some distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits. These webcasts are available to view at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive. And to log your distance education CM credits, just follow the instructions listed on the website. You can also follow us on Twitter at Planning Webcast or like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by Chapters, Divisions, and Universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM, select today's date, which is Friday, May 4th, and then select today's webcast, which is the new markets model, making a case for healthy retail strategies. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We are also recording today's webcast, and it will be available along with a PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive. And at this time, I would like to introduce our speakers for today, Jill Clark and Kara Martin. Jill Clark is the director for the Ohio State University's Center for Farmland Policy Innovation Center. The center is designed to match local food development and farmland protection goals with needed resources. Through these local to state partnerships, the center provides model food development and farmland protection strategies for Ohio communities and other interested partners. Healthy corner store projects are a current focus of the center. Jill received her Ph.D. in Geography in 2009 from Ohio State University. Kara Martin is a principal of Urban Food Link, a small consulting firm that partners with businesses, local governments, and organizations working on community food planning to address food security and access issues. As a food system planner, Kara's work focuses on community food projects by providing food system assessments, policy recommendations, and healthy retail technical assistance. Urban Food Link collaborative partners include the King County Food and Fitness Initiative, Ohio State University's Center for Farmland Policy Innovation, and Public Health Seattle and King County. Kara received her master's in urban planning in 2009 from the University of Washington. So let's hand it over to Joe Clark, who will be our first presenter. Well, hello, and, and thank you all for joining us and for your interest uh, in, in healthy retailing. Uh, today we're going to cover a few things. Um, we're going we're to talk about why we even would intervene in a retail market to begin with, kind of how we got here. We're going to discuss healthy retailing and healthy retailing projects, go over some lessons learned, um, address uh, planners' role in healthy retailing, uh, address some critiques of, of these projects, and then uh, wrap up with um, showing you some resources, and then of course leaving plenty of time for question and answer. Um, but first, we want to find out a little bit more about who's on today's webcast. So, Brittany, if you could bring up um, our first poll. So I believe if you can see there um, the options. Please select the um, description that best fits kind of your role. All right, so we've got uh, quite a few um, city and regional planners, as we might expect, uh, but also uh, some other folks, not, not very many students on the call. Maybe we need to do some better outreach there. <laughs> okay, Brittany, if you want to close that poll. Great. All right, this gives us a, somewhat of an idea of who's joining us, um, but we have a couple other questions just to, to get us started. Uh, Brittany, if you could open the second poll for us. 
Okay, so this is just trying to get a sense of um, you know where you're at in, in regards to healthy retailing or healthy corner store projects. Have you participated in a project? Um, has your community shown some interest? Um, have you done some reading on the topic, or is this really just completely new to you? And it looks like if, you know for most of you this is uh, this is a new topic, uh, which is good. We're going to be covering you know some of the basics today, in addition to um, you know talking about our experiences on um, in doing these projects across the country. Okay, Brittany, if you could close that poll for us. And then finally, uh, Kara and I uh, would like to um, get a sense of um, the size community you're coming from. Uh, healthy corner store projects have started mostly in urban areas or moving into rural areas and, and, and covering a wide range of community sizes. And so we'd like to get a sense of where you're coming from as far as the population of, of where you work. Uh, if you could bring up the third poll for us, Brittany. So you can see there, um, you know, are you working in a community less than 5,000, more than 50,000, and then all the options in between. So we've got some heavy representation from our largest cities. And, and again, this is you know, where, where you see uh, the majority of uh, healthy retailing projects taking place. Okay, Brittany, if you could close that poll for us. So, you know, how did we get here? Uh, why do we? Why would we even consider intervening in the marketplace? Uh, you know, to intervene in a market, we really have to make an a uh, an assumption that there's some sort of market failure. Uh, you know, with healthy retailing, you know, a couple come to mind. This could be some sort of market failure in access. Uh, it could be, which I, well, I'll address shortly, or it could be a failure in that there's just a few players who monopolize the system, and in our case, it would be um, the food system. Well, when I talk uh, about kind of how we got here, I, I really think about two things. One is food industry trends, but the other is development trends. And Let's talk first about food industry trends. Uh, we have gotten to the point where food is really treated very much like a, like a widget. Um, and it's a very industrialized process. Um, and why does that matter? Uh, when, you in, when you have an industrialized system, values created by transforming raw products, um, adding inputs, and creating something new. And um, the more that you can transform that raw po product, the more value in that. So the more, the more money, the more you industrialize. So we've been very successful in, um, in our food system of making a lot of food for really cheap and being shelf stable. Um, and you know, food has become just like any other industry, like auto manufacturing. Um, and like other industries, there's been structural changes in that industry. We've had, um, you hear about vertical integration in other industries, it's happening in food as well. And there's been this concentration um, and changes in ownership and control of the food system. You know, we have mega food uh, clusters emerging, you hear ADM, you know, supermarket to the world. And uh, you know, what does this mean? Well, it means that the scale and the size of actors has changed. We've got very large actors and fewer of them that are um, controlling most of, of what we eat. So as I mentioned, we've been very, uh, very good at making uh, food uh, affordable. Um, and you know, this is a, a little uh, graph from the New York Times uh, back in 2009, just showing the relative costs over the past few decades of fresh fruits and vegetables as compared to so things like soda and beer. And so we have cheaper food. And as I mentioned, there's been changes in the structure of the food system, so we have fewer but larger players. Um, here I pick on uh, or the organic industry. A lot of folks think organics are kind of immune to changes that we've seen in the food system. Um, this is a graph from Phil Howard. If you've never seen his infographics, they're really uh, wonderful. Um, and it shows the consolidation of the organic retailing industry going back to 1984. Uh, and it, you know, many of you are aware that you know now we've We've had a merger between um, 
you know, Whole Foods and uh, Wild Oats here past 2007. But you can see this um, the changing in the, in the structure of our industry where we've got fewer players and they're getting even bigger and they're getting physically bigger. So if you think about retail outlets and big boxes, this is shows retailing, but this could be about processing, it could be about distributing, it could be about production um, right at the core. So you add that to some of our development trends. Um, you know, as stores get bigger, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, their footprints are getting bigger in addition to kind of the size of the, the, the companies. They need larger spaces to, to plop down big boxes, and greenfields provide those places. You know, where are the greenfields? Well, they're not in our urban areas. Um, many of our ex-urban locales uh, lack the tools to really guide this type of development, I, and that's been my experience, um, particularly in Ohio. And stores locate where they think there's a market. Uh, and they don't consider low-income areas to have uh, much of a market. So as we sprawl, wealth leaves our cities and our urban areas, and so does retail. So retail follows people. You complicate that with um, historic um, racist and classist lending practices. They make it difficult for um, small businesses to develop and, and survive, and also uh, limits access to certain infrastructure and services uh, by many minority and low-income residents. So we have these food industry trends and development trends that really result in uh, what we call food access gaps. Um, many of you may have heard the term food deserts. That's another, another term. And um, there's actually a lot of debate now on um, whether or not to use that term. Um, and, and, uh, and, and it's going to be addressed here in the literature soon. But you know, food access gaps, we've got fewer larger grocery stores moving to our suburbs and exurbs and out of our poor urban and rural areas. The small independently owned stores left find it hard to attract investments and hard to access large consolidated healthy food distribution streams that favor the bigger players. So if our structure for system favors bigger players, it's hard for those smaller actors to, to um, get healthy foods into their stores. Um, the food they can access is more shelf stable and, and cheaper. And that's why you see the Frito-Lay rep showing up at the corner store and not a representative for fruits and vegetables. Now, so in short, good food is, is elsewhere, not, not in food access gaps. I think at this point it's, it's important to um, talk about access. Uh, access is multifaceted. Access just isn't can you get to a place that sells food. Um, and you see with a lot of food desert mapping, really relying just on physical access. But access is also about when you get there, can you afford it? Um, it's also you know, it, when you get there, can you afford it and is it healthy? And then I would add, um, and, 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 and some other um, folks that work in this arena would add, it's not just can you get there, can you afford it, is it healthy, but it's do you want to shop there and do you want to um, eat the, the, what's offered at that location. And so there's, um, access is really a complicated picture. And I know Kara will address this a little bit later as well. So we look at food access gaps. There's a perception, um, as I alluded to before, that there's no market here. And that's where the new market model comes in. It really recognizes that people in these neighborhoods, whether we're talking urban or rural, um, they have purchasing power. Um, and, and so what might be some uh, strategies for addressing these access gaps? Well, one strategy is, well, why don't we just put a new retail outlet in, in these places where people have um, healthy food access uh, or having problems with healthy food access. You know, so it'd be, well, let's try to attract a, a large-scale supermarket, like a, a Kroger, you know, here in the Midwest. Um, you know, that, that is a model. Um, it's a more difficult model. You know, often uh, it's not that um, the large supermarkets are missing an opportunity. Um, they're located where their model tells them is the best place to locate. Um, there's also an alternative, alternative models like co-ops, so creating a new retail outlet that has some sort of alternative ownership structure. There's the option of looking at alternative distribution methods. Uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm located, uh, we have the Veggie Van, um, which will um, take fresh produce into different neighborhoods uh, throughout the growing season. Uh, there's also looking at developing a new transportation opportunities. I think it's in Austin where um, they have a, 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 a bus that's specifically designed to take people from an area deemed to have access problems, um, kind of the, a grocery shuttle. Um, 
And then finally, and what we're really going to be talking about here is the option of working with existing outlets. These existing outlets can be, you know, you often hear about healthy corner store projects, so they can be corner stores. Um, they can be convenience stores. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of work in rural areas um, where uh, we're really focusing more on gas stations, or as <laughs> one of our projects is actually at a brew through. Um, and if you're not familiar with what a brew through is, it is what it sounds like you drive through the building to get your brew. So, um, you know, looking at just any kind of existing infrastructure um, with food sales. So, what is what is healthy retailing in general? Um, healthy retailing is just about promoting the sales of healthy foods through not just stocking, but also marketing the items. Um, such as fresh produce in places that are considered to have healthy food access gaps. Um, you know, often the goal is to uh, ensure that healthy foods are more not just available but affordable. And as I've, I've said already, the, you know, these are most often in urban areas, but you see more and more is happening in rural areas and some suburban areas as well. And healthy retailing can really be on a, a wide spectrum. It can be about introducing new items, yes, so maybe you're working with a store that's never carried um, fresh produce and, um, you know, so it's introducing a new item. It could be expanding variety or quantity of items. So let's say you're working with an outlet that uh, maybe, maybe they had bananas at the counter. Um, and so you help them carry more whole fruits and next thing you know you have peaches and bananas and, and apples at the counter. Um, so it could be about expanding variety or quantity. Uh, it could also be about improving quality, and it can be about um, you know all the way up to um, getting a store that isn't already in WIC approved or, or SNAP approved, you know, or the food stamp program. So it really can be on a spectrum from you know working with a place that maybe they carry whole milk, but you introduce skim milk, or they already have uh, white bread, but you introduce whole grain bread, or maybe it's a grab and go nutritious snack at the corner. Uh, maybe it's uh, working with fruits and vegetables, I've, I've mentioned those already, which are one of the hardest categories of, of foods to work with um, because of perishability and handling and distribution, and uh, Karen might touch on a little bit of that later. It could be about doing some store enhancements, um, working with places to um, take down um, negative, uh, the, well, I, I call it negative, but, um, you know, cigarette and beer signage in the windows and, um, you know, cleaning up, uh, cleaning up signage, or developing some branding, or helping to co uh, cost share on equipment, uh, painting, um, and bringing in new shelves. Um, you know, one of our projects it involved fixing floor tiles, so um, you had a smooth surface to walk to the healthy items. Um, so it can be just a few kind of store enhancements. It could be completely overhauling a store. Um, so again, it's, it's not a, a spectrum. Um, and there's a range in cost per store. You know, I've worked on uh, projects that are just a couple of thousand dollars. I know Kara's stores that she's working on right now average about $20,000 per store. The projects go up to $100,000 per store. Um, you know, for our budget, you know, we, we budgeted again um, to help with marketing and time for a coordinator and um, some new equipment that the store was going to have to carry. But most importantly, um, for us, being new to healthy retailing, we built in um, funds for someone to provide technical assistance. And this is actually how I met Kara. Um, you know, we were looking for you know who around the country is doing healthy retailing, and uh, came across the Delridge uh, toolkit, which is referenced later in this presentation. Uh, Kara and her uh, colleagues uh, developed this toolkit, and um, it, you know, it was an excellent source, but we wanted more than the toolkit. We wanted some on-demand technical assistance, and so we budgeted for technical assistance. Uh, Karen ended up helping us with initial project planning and then ongoing technical assistance, not just for us at the university, but for our community partners working out in the field. Uh, I couldn't help but put in a couple of photos from our projects. Um, on the right you see, this is in uh, Chansey, Ohio, which is a very rural area. This is in a brew-through. It used to be when you pulled through um, uh, this store, you would uh, see cotton candy and uh, beef jerky, and uh, now you can see some of the offerings there last year. On the left-hand side, you see a very urban place in um, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, you know, again, combos and beef jerky were replaced with uh, that end cap there. 
I mentioned that often the objective is about availability and affordability of healthy foods, but you know, healthy retailing actually can address other objectives, such as uh, creating safe places in the neighborhood. Um, it can be a form of community engagement that goes well beyond um, healthy food. Uh, it could be about boosting the local economy. Uh, one of our stores um, was part of uh, a whole retail strip revitalization and um, has been and contributing to um, foot traffic, increased foot traffic in that neighborhood. Now a little bit about um, the healthy retailing model itself. Uh, the way I've described this before is it's really balancing two things. Healthy retailing isn't just about bringing in new products, right? I mentioned it's also earlier about marketing and such. So it's also about creating demand for those products. Um, you know, it's access isn't just about physical access. Again, as I mentioned before, there's that access is multifaceted. It also includes working on the demand side. Um, so, thinking about how we balance this out, the way the way that I've described it before is it's figuring out where you want to work. So, you know, what areas um, where do you have food access gaps? Identifying where your efforts should be put. It's about getting the store owner engaged and the manager, not just interested but committed to doing healthy retailing. Um, while understanding, you know, they may share healthy retailing objectives with you, so it might be my objective that, you know, I want to um, increase fruit and vegetable consumption in a neighborhood. They may share that notion, but you always have to remember it's still their business. Um, working on distribution. Distribution, and I know Kara will address this, is key. Um, Efficient and effective distribution uh, cannot be overemphasized how important um, it is uh, on the supply side. On the demand side, we're looking at um, conducting things like a community needs assessment. Community needs assessment can serve several purposes. First, it can help you identify where people are already shopping in the neighborhood. It might help you pick a store um, or stores, plural. It will also arm you with that background research on what healthy items neighbors want, um, which you can take back to store owners and say, hey, this is, this is what's being demanded in the neighborhood. It also gets neighbors interested and excited about the project. Uh, to drive demand, particularly with new products, nutrition education is key. Um, things like cooking demonstrations or easy recipe cards that highlight products found right in the stores. And then finally, engagement in marketing, you know, letting neighbors know about the efforts, doing branding and traditional marketing. I really um, think that by focusing on both supply, especially distribution, and demand, you can keep prices reasonable. And so they really balance one another. Um, and so this can also be looked at as, you know, on one hand, working with stores, and the other, working with communities. It's not without its challenges, and I know Kara's going to be talking about these um, a little bit. Um, on the supply side, some of the challenges are, you know, uh, there's, there's a reason why small stores tend to carry cheaper, longer lasting products on their shelves. Um, that means that people working at the stores might be unfamiliar with selling um, fresh produce if you're working with fresh produce. Finding a distributor that's willing to work with small stores, huge barrier, huge challenge. Um, a lack of demand, uh, um, customers being unfamiliar with some of what you're bringing in. And here you see I'm, I'm focusing on produce because my projects tend to focus on produce, but as I mentioned this could be about other products as well. Uh, quickly, um, you know, the stakeholders, uh, there's a, we look at a wide range of uh, needing a wide range of expertise and resources and trying to bring as many stakeholders in as possible. You know, the critical difference um, for us, I believe, in our projects has been getting people from the community, not just involved and at the table from very, the very beginning, but getting them, um, we have community coordinators who actually work with community groups to do these projects on the ground. Um, you can see there's a variety of types of groups that lead these kinds of projects um, from universities, community groups, um, local governments. Here's just a sample of the locales where some of these projects are taking place. And just a short list of um, how some of these projects are funded. I was surprised in, in calling around the country how many people are doing self-funded projects. Um, community development block grants is one way we've found. Um, community foundations has also been a source of our funding. Specialty crop block grants through our Department of Agriculture was also a source of funding, and a little bit unique, I think. Um, so I'm gonna, before I pass it off to Kara, who's going to take us um, kind of a little bit further down this journey and talk about some of her experiences, I do want, um, Brittany, could you bring up uh, the fourth poll? 
I want to get a sense, uh, now that you've had your very quick um, Healthy Retailing 101, um, how many of you might think that this would work where, where you are? So I think uh, we've got a, an option for yes, no, and then a, and then a maybe. All right. So the, the, we're looking at quite a few maybes and, and uh, second line, a whole lot of yeses. All right. Okay, well, we're going to actually repeat this poll after you hear a little bit from Kara um, and, and some of her experiences and the role that she sees planners playing uh, in this. Okay, so um, Kara, I'm going to pass it off to you. All right. Thank you, Jill. All right. Uh, so a couple things that I would like to discuss are the things that we want to consider um, if, this, if you're considering if the strategy has potential in your community. And then take a look at some of the barriers and solutions that um, have come out to work and how planners can help address these barriers. Um, but before we dive into that, you might be thinking, well, how does this relate to me? All right, um, so as planners, um, we're not suggesting that the planner is necessarily the implementer of this work, but we want to think about how our skills and how and our expertise can really lend to this economic development tool. Um, as Jill mentioned, this tool really started in highly dense neighborhoods where we see some of the quote food deserts where there is a disappearance of supermarkets um, and as well as the infrastructure that tends to support these small grocers um, where, and makes it um, less uh, um, viable for them to actually carry uh, fresh and perishable groceries. And so what we see that leading to is similar to the what we see in the photo on the left um, where we see a high concentration of shelf-stable uh, unhealthy um, food items um, and creating a limited access to healthy foods in these neighborhoods. But this isn't just um, an urban issue, as Jill mentioned. It's also um, happening in rural areas. Here we have a map. Um, this is the state of Washington, um, where I'm from. And the darker the blue are the um, farther distances that um, people have to drive in order to get to a full service grocery. So while they might have one or two small convenience type stores in their town, um, in order to get you know just fresh um, fruits and vegetables, they have to drive. Um, in the darker blue, it's anything from 15 to 37 miles to access a grocery store. And part of that is also similar reasons um, with the urban areas where there's uh, not an infrastructure to support these small grocers, um, it's been disappearing and consolidated at that scale. Um, so it, distributors are less likely to go through these smaller towns. And in suburban areas, we see some um, other access issues. Um, some of it has to deal with the street network and the design. So the photo on the left, we see, um, sorry, it's a little grainy, but the, there's um, a mother and their child, a child pushing a grocery cart full of food. Um, there are parts of the community there where they may not have access to an automobile, so they're dependent on walking and bus transportation. So getting groceries can be quite difficult. In this photo you see um, it's a five-lane highway, and the closest crosswalk to the other side of the street is quite some distance. Um, and you can't even see a bus stop that's along um, this photo. Um, and the, the other trait that comes out is uh, we might see a higher concentration of um, establishments that tend to carry on more unhealthy options um, rather than healthier options, such as the photo on the right. Um, in addition to thinking about our land use patterns and transportation network, um, we also want to think about the types of businesses that are in our communities, because um, this is going to really impact the types of incentives um, and services that your project provides 
as well as the policies um, and regulations that you might want to address to support this work. So in your community, it might range from anything from a convenience store, such as the Super 24, to um, maybe there's chain stores, such as Walgreens. Um, we actually, for a project that we worked here in um, King County, Washington, we ended up working with, uh, with seven uh, different Walgreens stores. Um, so uh, I think that's a little unique. Uh, most of these projects have tended to work with um, independently owned. In addition, you might have uh, some smaller grocers. Um, one on the, the photo on the bottom right is a halal store. Um, we worked with over 25 stores, I think, that were small um, ethnic-owned um, grocers where they carry a lot of food um, that you typically can't find in a supermarket. And this leads to um, kind of the next point of thinking about where your community wants to shop. Um, as Jill mentioned, um, food, uh, that food access is multifaceted, and it's not just about proximity and physical access to food. But we also need to think about um, the cultural appropriateness of food in stores. So communities uh, may not want to shop in a supermarket. They may want to be shopping in a small ethnic grocery where they can find foods that they're familiar with. Um, and, and, and it's also a place where they can speak their own language. Um, and a, a place of communi a community resource. Uh, so we did mention earlier that uh, supermarket attraction is uh, one of the strategies that some communities are um, using to address food access in their community. But um, in this case, um, yeah, it, it might not be the right solution. For example, there's a city that we worked with here in um, King County that they have one supermarket um, and we did a, a, a food landscape assessment of um, the, the retailers in their community and it turns out they had a dozen or more small grocers in the city um, and if you looked at the, the demographics it was really reflective of the, those types of stores and so attracting a supermarket um, may not be the best solution and, and really fit the needs of the community or, or their interest and demand. So hopefully this gives you some ideas on um, things to consider um, in thinking about applying this strategy in your community and um, thinking beyond that this is just an urban um, model and that really it, it's being applied it can um, work in communities of all sizes. So next I'd like to move on to the barriers that we find in this work and the potential um, solutions um, that we as planners can help address. So first I'd like to start with uh, the policies um, that may um, counter this, this work. Um, in some of the suburban cities that we worked with in, here in King County, there um, one of our priorities was to work in areas where there was limited access to food um, by physical proximity. So places where um, there may not be a supermarket within a half a mile. Um, this map here of the city of Des Moines um, shows where those areas would fall. So anything that is white is more than a mile, and the pale purple, the lightest color of purple, is um, more than a half a mile from uh, a supermarket. Now, there aren't very many small stores that fall into that paler um, color. Those would be the stores that we would, would really ideally want to work with um, so we could increase access in those areas. Um, now, if we were to overlay zoning onto this, it would become very clear why um, there weren't any establishments located in that white or pale um, purple um, areas. And that was because it's zoned for residential. Um, and with these separate land uses, it doesn't really allow for us to apply this strategy to work with retailers in areas of limited physical access to supermarkets. So one um, way to begin addressing this is um, through our um, policy tools. The city of Des Moines um, 
received some funding um, through uh, the CDC. Um, our, so our public health department here in King County received funds through the CDC um, through stimulus grant, stimulus funds, and those funds were dedicated to address obesity and health disparities through um, systems and environmental change. Um, so our Healthy Retail Project was part of that. There were 50 projects funded, um, which also included half a dozen or more cities to take a look at their um, land use and transportation policies to see how they could um, improve access to healthy eating, as well as physical activity. Um, so one of the things that Des Moines did is they took a, took a look at their comp plan, and they um, did two things. They created a new element called a Healthy Des Moines, and they also interwove policies and goals into the existing um, elements. So here is their land use element. And I want to point out the third policy on the very bottom, um, the supporting of concentration, concentrations of neighborhood, community, and retail amenities and services in close proximity to residential neighborhoods. So what this is, is it really starts to give us guidance, the, the community guidance, um, and some leverage to move to the next step. And, and of what they are doing right now is the city is looking at their zoning. Um, so they can start to bring in some more mixed use into some of those areas. So those areas that are in the white and the pale purple, we can start to possibly see some uh, food retailers um, come into existence. The, the next piece um, that it seems to be one of the biggest challenges um, to address with this work is the sourcing. And this really comes back to what Jill was talking about with the consolidation of um, the food system and there being uh, a shift to, from smaller to fewer and larger um, actors, um, it's difficult for the, the small businesses to enter into the market stream for um, fresher, um, fresh perishable products. Um, and part of that is because of the cost. Um, the, they have a higher um, minimum purchase requirement. Um, for, and so it's difficult for these businesses to really um, get started um, in selling perishable products, um, it's particularly fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, another barrier that comes along with that is some of the street ordinances or our street layout designs um, might conflict with the delivery of these types of products. And lastly, the building and design codes as well. Um, can make it difficult to, to deliver products, especially when you think of these perishable items that um, require a more frequent um, delivery. So some of the solutions. Um, the top one um, is something that we did with our project. Um, our healthy retail project was actually housed under the City of Seattle's um, Office of Economic Development. So that really gave us um, um, the capacity to connect with other businesses and community lenders. Um, so one thing that we did is we worked with a, um, a local wholesale produce wholesaler and established this great relationship and talked and we were able to really um, share with them the, the barriers that these small businesses face in, in, in selling um, fresh produce and that they there is a demand and a desire to do so, but it's difficult for them to um, start with the minimum orders, which were like $200. Um, so we worked with um, this business, Charlie's Produce, and these stores were able to start working, start at a much lower level, at $50 um, rather than $200, and build their, their way up. So um, building this relationship with a distributor was really key. And that's something that we can do as planners is, um, you know, make those connections, um, particularly for businesses that um, may not be aware um, or familiar with um, services and resources out there. We can also start to uh, help address the, some of the regulatory barriers. 
um, that I mentioned around like the street ordinances and delivery times. I'm not going to go into detail on this. Um, I'm going to pitch the, the next week's um, APA webinar is the urban goods movement that, and they recently just came out uh, with a guide that has um, a lot of case studies and really looks at the flow of goods through the city. And it's more than just food, you know, any goods. It could be clothing. Um, but they give a lot of great um, suggestions on, you know, if, if this is the type of um, problem you're facing, here's a potential solution. Um, so I would suggest um, if this is a, something you're interested in, to check out that webinar next week. Um, and lastly, um, we can help support um, new ventures such as food hubs. Um, you may have heard of this term. It's starting to get more attention um, and pick up a lot of speed. It, food hubs are um, they're usually um, facilities that um, address um, pull in different pieces of the food system. So it can be the aggregation of um, produce and other um, foods from the local local farmers, um, the processing of it to the distribution of it. Um, and these are relatively new, it's a relatively new concept and type and new facilities might have different types of requirements. Um, and so as planners we can help walk them through that process and really support that work. That can support um, your regional food economy. Next thing I wanted to discuss is the financing um, barrier. Um, as Jill mentioned, you know, food access is multifaceted, and there is this economic component where um, people um, may have a difficult time affording food. Um, on the other side, it, the it, the businesses might also have some financial barriers as well that um, make it difficult for them to provide um, healthier foods um, for their customers. And particularly, they might have um, limited access to capital and other business um, development resources. Um, Jill mentioned that there is, if for these projects, we've really seen a range of the amount spent. It can be as little as a few thousand dollars to uh, you know, $100,000. Just to show you how far a small amount can go, um, this store here is um, a little store. We saw the storefront a few slides back. Um, prior to working with them, they had, this was their produce display. Um, you can't really tell, but this refrigerator was, had water leaking from the bottom. They were spending probably $600 every few months to have it repaired. Um, and it was not energy efficient. This is a non-air conditioned, um, pretty small, you know, under um, 800 square feet um, building. Uh, through our project, what we, we are very fortunate to have funding to provide seed capital for the stores. And what we did is we did an 80-20 split. So we put in 80% and the stores put in 20%. And that for this case, we are able to um, help them purchase a brand new refrigerator. It's more energy efficient, isn't breaking down. Um, and for the same cost of what they repair in a few months, their $600 was the 20%, um, we were able to help them purchase this. So, so this refrigerator is around $3,000. Pretty minimal cost when you think about what they now can provide in their store. And it's more than they're, that they are now able to provide um, sell produce, which you can see it's just stock full. But this is also part of the WIC program depending on what state you are in, um, stores that um, are WIC certified need to carry um, fruits and vegetables. So this also helps them um, provide more affordable options for their customers. Uh, so some other solutions um, can range from uh, looking at licensing and permitting process and how you can reduce the fees or even streamline it. Um, one example is, um, and I, forgive me for not knowing the exact public health department, um, but in West Virginia, one of the things they did is reduce the public public health permit fees, um, and it was by a very small amount. It was like 10 or 20 percent 
um, over a five-year period. And what that did is it gained, um, they're able to really engage the, the business and get their commitment over a longer period of time. And it, and it came down to like maybe $50 a year is what the, the business was saving. Um, so it can be a small amount. Um, you can also um, work on incentivizing the sales of of fresh foods um, through programs such as New York City's Fresh Program. Um, and through this, they've offered a range of incentives, anything from a sales tax exemption to a real estate um, reduction, tax deduction. So it, I would suggest just Googling this if you want to um, get more details on it. But they offered a, quite a range. And this was really more for um, encouraging developers to include a, you know, a certain percent of their square footage being dedicated towards um, fresh foods. Um, another thing that we can help out on is building the coordination and um, collaboration among the various stakeholders. Um, for example, um, can making it easier for these smaller businesses to connect with um, community lenders and other financial resources as well as um, working on the concurrency across departments and agencies, because this can really lead to some more efficient business planning and cost savings for these businesses. So for example, here in King County, um, we worked with a handful of businesses that we discovered that didn't have a public health permit. And in talking to them, we realized they they weren't aware of it because that they needed this public health permit, primarily because they came from a country that did not have a public health permit um, system. So they were didn't even know it existed. Um, and then compounding the issue is when they got they somehow needed to get their city business license. When they got their city business license, they were told now you can do business. Um, so they didn't realize there was another layer, another license that they needed to get. So this could be such a simple fix of when a business is going through a plan review and getting a business permit, just adding a line to the application that if, if it's a food retailer to check with your local public health department um, about getting your permit. Because this, this can close down a business or create some pretty high fines. It also affects if they're just opening and they're figuring out the different equipment they need and their layout, um, they might have to go through the process um, you know, basically more than once. So health detail is just one piece of this. Um, hopefully, the past few slides have shown that um, there's other things that we can look at and other um, policy tools that we um, need to pull into place that can really help amplify and support this work. Um, as planners, we can help address and assess um, our food retail environment to determine um, if this strategy is appropriate for a community and where we could prioritize this work. Um, we talked about the comprehensive plan and the zoning regulations that can also support this work rather than setting the goals ahead of time that like happened in our pilot project of working in areas where there is limited physical access to discover we had zoning that um, really <laughs> was limiting and um, finding and identifying those businesses. Um, we can think about integrating this into other plans, food access issues, um, particularly I'm thinking of transportation. And thinking back to that photo where we saw the family pushing a grocery cart and there being um, limited um, transit access around the supermarkets, as well as you know, looking at the pedestrian-friendly um, amenities that could be um, incorporated around those areas as well. Um, and lastly, um, you know, kind of a, a minimal first step that you could do is pass a resolution in your city to um, really start to engage your electeds in the community and to draw awareness to this issue and begin to figure out what the next steps are. So we've, um, here in King County, we saw a handful of cities that 
have passed this resolution that really sets a commitment to looking at this issue over time. Um, so a good starting point to see the breadth of what you could do in um, not just healthy retail, but kind of all these other pieces that I've just mentioned is this new food access and policy, food access policy and planning guide that a couple of my colleagues um, just published. And you can find it on my website, but it gives a great range of what you can do um, in the different um, cities that have done this work. So if you're thinking, well, I'm in a smaller town, you know, that may not work. Well, it will give you an example um, of the different types of cities that it has worked. So this work is still relatively new, um, and there's still, but there's been a lot done in the past couple years, I would say. And, and a lot of it is because of um, the public health arena and the, this uh, grant um, stimulus funds that were given through the CDC, where we saw 50 sites uh, throughout the country um, receive funding, and many of them did healthy retail work. So the next thing we'd like to talk about is some of our critiques. And I'm going to pass this back to Jill, who will discuss that. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kara. Um, you know, healthy retailing, as Kara suggested, is, um, is becoming um, more popular um, as, a, as a solution um, in food access gaps, or as you know, other people might refer to as food deserts. Um, and I know that there was a question about showing some of those places. Um, that uh, To go back to that slide, and um, these slides will be available, plus um, there's a resource that I'm going to show you here in a moment that uh, does list a lot of the project areas where, where, these, uh, where this program is taking place. But we should definitely point out that there are some critics uh, when it comes to um, healthy retailing. Um, and also um, some specific critiques, particularly um, as you may have gotten a sense from today's webcast, um, even if it's a small intervention, it still takes it still takes a lot of work, and it can take resources, whether that be you know, time or, or, and or money. Um, and so, you know, often we'll hear, well, isn't there, a, what if there's an easier solution that you've overlooked? Um, and in thinking about um, one uh, coordinator for a healthy store project that I spoke with, um, that was definitely uh, something that um, this person who I was interviewing had said that they overlooked. There was an easier transportation-related solution, and instead they had a failed corner store project. Um, something that I've experienced in my own work is being really excited about healthy retailing as a solution, but not really having a problem. Um, and what do I mean by this? Uh, I think um, particularly with the rise in food policy councils around the country, there's you know this um, search for solutions to um, food deserts and food access gaps. And healthy retail retailing does arise as one of those solutions. Um, and and uh, if there happen to be grant dollars available, suddenly you have people vying for grant dollars, but don't necessarily know exactly where or how they're going to apply those. And so we've had the case where um, people had um, received funding to do a project but didn't know exactly where to apply it. And the community they wanted, the neighborhood they wanted to work in, didn't consider themselves to be a food desert. They had been labeled such, but they did not consider themselves living in a food desert and did not support the work. Um, another issue is that um, food access isn't entirely often a food system problem. Um, and we're taking a food system solution to what might be um, have larger underlying problems. Um, such as poverty, and um, you know, does providing access solve um, the access problem if there's bigger uh, looming issues? Um, so there are some critics out there, some um, actually notable um, uh, geographers. I think Julie Guthman's written on this. Something that I am, am pretty concerned about, particularly in our own projects, is uh, you know what happens when um, healthy retailing when when we leave when the intervention is 
quote unquote complete? Um, how do these projects sustain themselves? You know, I'd like to think that um, we're designing this, uh, these projects so that people in the neighborhood and, and also the store owners carry, carry the work on. Um, but, you know, we've already had the experience where one of our um, stores sold to a different owner. And um, if that had happened when we weren't um, in the middle of this process, um, you know, we, we may not have been able to get that store back, the, the new store owner um, back into to our program. Um, so I think this idea of um, sustainability of, of projects into the future, um, particularly when, you know, as in our case, this is being driven by, you know, dollars that are coming from outside the neighborhood and involves people from outside the neighborhood. We do have neighborhood partners, um, but they're not um, solely driving the bus where there's several of us driving. Um, and uh, I think, and, and Kara, I, I'm sure would echo this, that um, there, while there has been some evaluation, uh, there isn't, I would say, a wealth of evaluation um, looking at whether or not these projects effectively address um, the problems that result by having food access gaps or by being in food deserts. Um, so there's questions about their effectiveness. Um, now having, having said that, um, and, and something I want to point out and, and cannot overemphasize is that when it comes to finding out, you know, have these solutions been effective? You might not find a lot in the literature about evaluation, but evaluation, some evaluation is happening. And we were pretty surprised at how very willing and open people across the country are who have done these projects to talk with um, NMNubies. I mean, we, we started this back in January of 2011 and called, uh, called folks from all over the country just to learn about their experiences. And we were really surprised that one of our best resources ended up being people that have done this work before. And we're very open to sharing um, uh, project plans and experiences and lessons learned. Um, I've already uh, mentioned the Delridge Healthy Corner Store project, which is a toolkit which is available on the publications page of Urban Food Link. And then there are some other really good resources. The, one I want to, uh, the other one I want to specifically point out on this page is the Healthy Corner Stores Network. I mentioned earlier um, that I, I noticed one of the questions was about um, you know, where these projects had taken place. Um, you can go on their website. You can join the Healthy Corner Stores Network and get on their listserv. And you can also see where some of the projects have been happening around the country. Um, other resources, you might be familiar with the Food Atlas from USDA. Um, work the Food Trust is, um, boy, I don't know how many, how many um, Healthy Corner Store initiatives they have now in Philadelphia, but it is, they're numerous. <laughs> um, and they've got some resources. And then at the bottom there is that guide that Kara mentioned that's available on her website. So at this point, um, Brittany, before we, before we go in and, and start addressing some of the questions, particularly, I, I know there were some questions about um, the fact that corner stores might make less money on fruits and vegetables and cost and pricing and um, some questions about rural experiences. But before we get to those questions, Brittany, could we bring up that, that last poll, which really is a, is a repeat of um, the question uh, that we had asked in the fourth poll, which is, you know, do you think this strategy um, is something that uh, might work in your um, area. And um, we're looking at about, let's see, a little bit more yeses, so um, a little bit more on the maybe. So we've got about 58% coming in at maybe, 60% at maybe, um, about 7% about on the noes, 8%, and about 31, 32% in the yeses. I'm going to let that polling go on for just a moment longer. So I didn't mean to end on, on the note of critiques, but there is, um, you know, you need to be able to go into these projects kind of with a, um, a healthy perspective on some of the barriers that other people have faced. Um, and, and, and would say that actually those resources should be an indication to you, um, at least around the country, of the, the broad movement in healthy retailing. And, and while there's critiques, there are still quite a bit of energy and it's really gaining. Okay, so um, maybe if we could 
uh, go ahead and close that poll. We ended up with a few more maybes, uh, some more, a uh, little bit less on the nose. Um, so about 61% maybe, 8% um, no, and 31% yes. Well, hopefully for all of you maybes out there, um, you can uh, use those resources that were listed uh, the, towards the end of the presentation. Um, at this point, Brittany, um, I am wondering, do you want to um, start with the, the Q&A? Do you want to take that, take that over? Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, let's see our first question. Um, I think you might have kind of answered this, but I'll just um, go ahead and ask it again. This comes in from Rush. Do supermarkets, which primarily cater to a lower class, raise their rates on healthy foods to match the maximum WIC reimbursement? Sometimes their costs are 75% to twice as much as the competitors. Maybe Kara can speak more to the WIC, but I'll, I'll just talk about the, the pricing. And particularly, again, my experience has been with fruits and vegetables. Um, yeah, some of the stores that we worked with, uh, when we came in, if they were selling anything, the prices were high. And it was mostly because they were going to the grocery store, the owner, store owner, buying fruits and vegetables from the grocery store, and then bringing them into their store, and then having to market them up. <laughs> um, and that is one of several reasons why you'd have higher prices. Of course, they're moving less um, product. Uh, so that is why working on a really effective and efficient distribution stream um, is, is really critical. One of the ways that we've gotten around this, and Kara had mentioned earlier with um, working with uh, distribution, one of the ways that we're working around this is um, getting the same distributor to go to several stores in the na same neighborhood, and so they get a cost break. Um, and working with store owners, so they realize they're not going to make a whole lot of money off fresh fruits and vegetables. I mean, that's just the, the markup. The return on investment on, on fruits and vegetables is a lot less than, let's say, on um, Frito-Lay potato chips. They may make a lot less money, but what they may gain, and this we have evidence to this, they're going to gain more foot traffic. Um, and so they may end up selling more other products. They're probably not going to make a whole lot on fresh fruits and vegetables, though. The question about WIC, I'm not as familiar because none of our stores um, uh, at this point, are WIC redeemers. So I don't know, Kara, if you have a, a perspective on the question about um, WIC and pricing. So with WIC, um, the Women, Infant, Children's Program, while it's a federal um, program, each state administers it. And so it's going to be different in a little bit in each state. Um, but what they do is they set these retailers into peer groups. Um, so the pricing uh, of the food could would, would be set different for small grocers versus a large supermarket. So the WIC program does recognize that the smaller stores are likely to have a higher price point for these foods. Um, but for the customers using the WIC um, checks to purchase, it doesn't affect them because their check says a very specific item. It, for example, might say a gallon of milk. That None of that's coming out of their pocket. If, they're paying, you know, three fifty for for milk. Um, that's the cost. That's the cost of the small grocer, and it's three dollars at the supermarket. That doesn't impact the the WIC client using the check. So, um, and I just want to um, add to what Jill was saying that fruits and vegetables can really be the loss leader of what's bringing um, customers into the store. In addition, um, just to give an example, of one of the successes we've seen. We worked with a Walgreens that um, started bringing in produce um, and dedicated an end cap where there's a lot of foot traffic. He was able to convince the corporate office. They're not given a lot of square footage within their stores um, at the you know individual store level to determine what they want to do. Um, and he was able to do a trial of the fruits and vegetables versus what they typically put at this um, end cap in the stores. And it's been a wild success, and corporate is very happy with um, what they are doing because they, the, he's actually making quite a bit of profit off of fruits and vegetables. Um, and this is a store that's in an area where there's very limited um, supermarket access, so that's part of the reason why it's doing so well, and a lot of pedestrians. Should we go on to the next question? Yeah, um, our next question comes in from Lenore. Um, so could you 
go back and mention some of the places where this is uh, taking place, the healthy retailing? These are just some examples um, of where healthy retailing is taking place. You've got very small places like Chansey, Ohio. Um, obviously, let's see, we have a um, San Carlos Reservation in Arizona, which is on a reservation. We have, um, you know, then very large cities such as Chicago, and you know, Philadelphia has been. Um, I, I believe that's where the food trust is working, and that's been. Um, uh, gosh, hundreds of projects I know that they're initiating there. Of course, you've got, uh, Kara, how many projects do you have going on in the Seattle area? We had one project that was working in 11 cities, including the unincorporated um, parts of the county. So that was all under one project. Um, and, and I know that there was a question in regards to, so in looking at this, obviously, um, you see a lot of really big urban areas. I think one of the questions was about rural areas and maybe some of the differences there. One of the, the, the things about rural areas that we're faced with is that um, we're not usually looking at people who do foot tra a lot of foot traffic. Um, and so our goal um, in Chansey, Ohio, was to select um, a place where people were already going for other things. So in this case, it was a the brew through, um, which was actually located right across from some essential community services, such as the library, the post office, town hall, um, places that people were really already going. Um, it doesn't um, you know, take into account people without vehicles, um, but if you look at um, um, you know, reciprocity when it comes to like uh, vehicle borrowing and things like that, um, you know, rural areas are a bit different. Um, so when we were when we were talking about our work in rural areas, it is a bit different than thinking about the physical accessibility than than urban areas. All right, great. Um, so our next question comes in from Jeanette. I think this refers to one of the maps that Kara showed. Why did you use a, a mile as a a measurement given the suburban landscape and the use of uh, private cars? Um, the reason we use the mile and, uh, well, we had this, a quarter, a half mile, and a mile, um, this grant was also focused on physical activity and creating um, environments where people could uh, more easily bike um, and walk um, through their um, neighborhoods and cities. So. That, and that's just kind of a standard um, proxy that we've seen. Um, it's a measurement that USDA has in their um, their food desert report. So that's what we worked with. And thinking of who has limited access to food at a um, at affordability level, you see a higher percentage um, of people not having um, automobile access is one of the common traits. All right, thanks. Um, our next question comes in from um, Dela uh, Shemek. I might have pronounced that wrong. Um, I think Kara responded to, to you in, in um, the chat box, but maybe you could talk a little bit more for everybody else about food hubs. Oh, yeah. I, I can't go into too much detail, but I was just going to show that a great resource was just released this week. The Wallace Center and USDA just came out with a resource guide on food hubs. And it's chock full of great information. It really explains what a, a food hub is. Um, and it gives a lot of different case studies of the different types. Because um, they they're all a little bit unique. Um, so I would just suggest um, going to that resource guide and even just looking at the first few pages to um, get a better sense of um, what a food hub is. They're um, a relatively new concept. And they're really more focused at um, the re your regional um, food economy level. So it's about um, not a, just about food access, but also um, really supporting the, your local um, food produce producers, particularly the small and mid-sized farms. All right, great. Um, so our next question comes in from Gordon. And have either of you been involved in the development of weekly farmers markets combined with um, food trucks located in, located in ways that also provide foot traffic in marginal retail store areas? Um, 
I don't have experience, but I know the, on that specific thing, but the policy guide that I um, that was mentioned, they they do talk about a um, kind of a, a mobile farmers market model that's um, kind of mini size compared to your typical uh, farmers market where there might be only five to eight um, farmers. Um, this is something that's been done in Minneapolis, so you might want to check out the resource guide just for more info on that. But Jill, did you have? Uh, no, no, I I, I was going to pass that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so this question comes in from Donna. The equipment upgrades for the refrigerator, the 80%, 20% funding, where did the money come from? What was the funding source? Uh, that was grant supported, so the stimulus funds um, that were distributed through our public health department, um, that's where that came from. I, you know, some programs just do an outright, you know, they have seed capital and they do a grant with the stores um, but we discovered by having them put in a you know a portion a contribution into the equipment purchases as well, um, not only um, got them more engaged and really committed to the work, but one of the things that we saw towards the end was more stores were interested in taking out smaller loans because they had seen the advantages of. Um, putting that financial invest investment to their store and not always getting the used equipment, but getting better, new, efficient equipment. So. Mm -hmm. And in our case, we uh, used a, a specialty crop block grant, which is why all of our work is focused on fruits and vegetables. And those specialty crop block grants come through um, your State Department of Agriculture. And we happened uh, during that funding round to have a supportive Department of Agriculture that looked at um, developing new markets for fruit and, ve and vegetables as a way to grow the local fruit and veg industry. Um, we also used a community development block grant. Um, and um, we also used, for another site, um, a local foundation, like a community-based foundation that was interested in the work. And, and, and as with CARA, we um, the, 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 our attempt has been to get buy-in, um, even if it is just a 20% buy-in from, from retailers. All right. And so, um, Kara, when you were discussing um, financing solutions in your presentation, you talked about the public health permit. Could you just um, explain what that permit's for? Yeah. Um, the public health permit is... Um, you, your public health department would be um, the one who administers that program, and it really is about food safety um, and you know making sure that establishments aren't um, that they're um, abiding by um, good food safety protocol and have the appropriate equipment. Um, and it seems that most it, it seems that in the, and this is I think just because the uh, a communication issue. Um, a lot of businesses think that it's for restaurants, but it's actually for any food establishment that is selling, quote, potentially hazardous foods. Um, and that means milk, eggs, um, cut fruits. So most food retailers actually need this public health permit. And so you might be just, just want to get familiar with your public health department and learn more about that process. But they at least here um, in King County, they have to go through a plan review where they give floor plans and they need to show, you know, where the equipment's going to be, the plumbing has to be, things, you know, have to be in a certain place and a certain distance away. So if you're already going through a plan review, having some coordination between that, um, those um, licensing processes could um, really help the business um, out. All right, and so our next question comes in from Charles. How have you researched and documented the demand for healthy products in the particular area to take that demand argument to the retailer? Well, one uh, of the things that we <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go, Jill? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll follow up. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the things that one of the community groups that we worked with, they um, the residents actually put together a survey, and they surveyed the neighborhood on uh, 
what type, if they wanted to be able to buy fruits and vegetables at you know, the one or two stores that were right there in the neighborhood, um, and also did, got a list of the, you know, the top five fruits and vegetables that people would want to buy, and if they wanted WIC and food stamps as well, they would use that. Um, and they took that to the store manager, and it was a pretty convincing statement. And within the week, he was selling produce. And in, in our experience, it's same thing, um, neighborhood run survey backed by our public health department. Um, they were able to you know, provide the um, kind of data entry and analysis once the survey was done. Um, we used a little bit different approach, and the surveys were given out wherever people were kind of congregating. So um, local agencies that, that people were passing through, um, uh, some like churches, um, uh, after school programming, um, there were dozens of, of sites where people could fill out a survey, um, and, in addition to kind of neighbor to neighbor. Um, the, the other thing, um, we're working, one of our neighborhoods uh, has uh, just an incredible amount of corner stores, um, some of which are used by the residents to shop, and some of which have other um, priorities and people don't shop. Um, and so. One of the other things was learning about where people are going for their shelf-stable items already, um, which stores are not going to, um, and so it also helped us narrow down um, which stores to approach. All right, great. Um, so our next question from Jeanette. Planners usually restrict or encourage a use, but not the user, e.g. what type of store, what products are sold. Thus, how does one create incentives or restrictions for particular produce? Are you limited to volunteer stores or municipal-owned property? Is it mainly a tax credit versus a land use regulation? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, some of the cities that we worked with when we were doing assessments and policy recommendations, they, um, they, we gave kind of the, the range of in, um, strategies you can use that varied from the carrot to the stick. And all of them came back with, we can't do the stick. We can't say that we're going to limit convenience stores or fast foods near like, our schools or um, parks. Um, but the incentive is something that seems to be um, that we, we're seeing in other cities. Um, you know, New York is one of those examples, but I really think it depends on your community um, and and your electives and what you're able to, um, what will work. And I, I would say for us, it's been incentive based as well. Um, what uh, Kara, what we or what we haven't talked about, something Kara helped us with is that at the beginning, um, because you're you're not every store owner is going to even be receptive to this idea. And and by the way, uh, you know, having neighbors do the request is really can be really impactful as Kara mentioned. So, you know, when our neighborhood coordinator was going into stores, I mean there were, you know, outright no's to somewhat of an interest and there's actually a whole art to um, kind of courting a store owner and um, Kara's got some I think some interesting slides on that. I don't know if you put those posted on your website, Kara, but um, one of the things that's done up front um, is a memorandum of understanding. It's not necessarily, we don't view it as a contract, but we do, we are pretty particular and it varies by store depending on what we're doing, um, what they're going to agree to do and what we're going to agree to do. Um, we're a little bit bigger in scope because obviously we do cover the planning aspects, but you know, we're more doing like the implementation of the project, so that's something, a tool that we've used that we rely on to make sure that, you know, they're kind of following the intent of the healthy corner store uh, or healthy retailing project that we're doing. So it's yeah, not, not forced into it. To, to just to go off of that, you know, at a project le level, it's definitely voluntary. Um, the, where we have seen the most success is where the business is really invested, um, you know, and that invested in time-wise and even financial um, to make this work. Um, but at a policy level, I think, and if you're mandating it, I mean, it's it, that's where it gets a little more sticky. Um, the Minneapolis has done 
um, included in their business licensing. If you want a grocery business license, you have to carry a certain number of um, types, a variety of fruits and vegetables. So I think it's like either three to five um, types of fruits and vegetables in your store. Um, and they have provided some uh, technical assistance and resources for their businesses, but um, it, it, initially it's easy for the stores to just, you know, have their apples, bananas, and oranges, but how do you monitor that along the way? And that's something I think it's now something they're now dealing with. But in order to get that business license, those stores are required to carry that minimum um, variety. All right, um, our next question comes in from Alex. Usually healthy foods are more expensive, um, for example, whole foods. How can the price be reduced to accommodate low-income neighborhoods? Want to take that, Jill? <laughs> well, you know, I think we, we've talked a little bit about um, the fact that with fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, you can't, uh, you can't represent um, and I'm going to, again, stick to produce because that's been my experience. Uh, you, you, you can't go into a store and suggest that they're going to be making, uh, store owners are going to make a whole lot of money on fresh produce because they aren't. I mean, that's just fresh produce, the markup is very minimal. The way to keep prices down, of course, um, is, you know, again, working on that distribution stream, making sure that the store owner knows that the, they have to be competitive, that the produce has to be competitively priced, but that in return, they what we what we sell is that they're going to get more foot traffic from the neighborhood. Um, there is a, a one of our experiences. Um, we had gone down to our southern Ohio site to the brew through, and we were in there. And um, uh, the, this one of the um, one of our project partners happened to be there, and a woman came in and she said, "Finally!" and went and grabbed produce. And um, I bet she goes back to that brew through a lot more. And then when she's there, picks up some other items. Um, so she's going there for her cucumbers. She might be picking up a few other things. And so the way we sell it to the store owners, if you can price it right, which you're not going to make a whole lot of money off, you might make money off other things. Plus, usually when you do these projects, there's an element of um, store enhancement, even if it's really cheap stuff like a coat of paint or you know, fixing, I mentioned fixing a tile, um, and it makes the store seem more inviting, and so that also can increase foot traffic. Um, so I agree, I, I absolutely agree that, um, that in real dollar costs, healthy foods can be more expensive. I mean, if you're talking about total costs, you know, we can get, we can argue that healthy foods are less expensive um, when you look at health issues, et cetera. Um, so that you have to look at this more holistically and not just from the sale of that particular item. Carrie, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, well, the, I, the only thing I want to add is one way to help address some of the affordability for the customers is for stores to um, have um, food stamps and WIC. And there are some policy issues with both of those programs. Um, what any kind of support and resources that you can provide for those stores so it's easier for them to get certified. Um, one you need to know we've seen is um, farmers market in your land use codes and defining what a farmers market is. You can define a farmers market as um, not just the establishment where the vendors um, are bringing in local um, grown raised um, foods, but also that it is a place that um, accepts food stamps and food stamps and then the WIC program and if it's available in the state as part of that definition. So it is a place that is more accessible for your um, low income residents. Um, so that's one way that, that you could address it at a, a policy level. I don't know if I would um, put that as a policy that these retailers should ex accept food stamps and WIC because there are some um, larger state and federal um, policy issues and barriers for the businesses to, it's not always easy for them to get certified. And something else I'd add is that um, when, um, when introducing items to a store, um, is working, um, the USDA has like a, a recipe finder that will price meals. Um, and you can, they really focus on our affordable, 
healthy uh, meals in those recipe cards. And so you can start to also, um, you know, through marketing and nutrition education, talk to customers about ways to um, make their dollar go further with those meals or their SNAP or WIC benefits depending on, on what, the, what the store has. But um, So that might be another way of looking at it is through that um, nutrition education and marketing. Okay, and Jill, just really quick, we had a question from Leslie um, asking what is a brew through? I'm guessing that's a, a drive through <laughs> convenience store, but maybe you'll just it, clarify. Yeah, fo yeah, focused on beer. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, so when you pull in, you know, there's usually the prominent, what's prominently there is beer and coolers on the sides. Um, and so, and the reason why I bring up the brew through is not only do I think it's just really interesting <laughs> to have a beer drive through as one of your sites, but that um, don't be limited in what you think about as existing infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, Kara was... Um, really changed my mind or changed my idea of what existing infrastructure is when you know, she really highlighted their work with chain stores. I really figured we'd have to be working with independent stores. And here they've been working with is it Walgreens, Kara? Yep, Walgreens. Yeah, with Walgreens. Um, and so, you know, thinking about gas stations, gas stations that already might carry like a grab and go like um, like prepackaged sandwiches or have a cooler for water and soda. Um, you know, thinking about thinking about those kinds of places, particularly when um, in the rural experience, where gas stations may be, you know, really the the closest thing to many rural residents. Yeah, I, I really second what Jill said. You got to really expand what you know you think could work. Um, I'm working with a store that is part of a hair salon. <laughs> It, it's really great to work with. <laughs> something that hasn't come up yet, but um, I believe, Kara, this was something that you have experience with. Um, something that hasn't come up yet is, uh, you know, store owners who might be a little, like maybe it's in a, maybe you've identified with the neighborhood and area you really want to work in, and there's only like one store owner, and, and the store owner is really reluctant. Um, uh, Kara, I, I think it was you who has worked on projects where you do kind of like a mini farmer's market in front of the store to demonstrate that fruit and vegetables can sell in the neighborhood. Is that? Yeah. 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 A, um, a community group that um, a nonprofit farm essentially um, rented a parking space to have a farm stand a couple times a week. Um, and then at the end of the, you know, the sale, they were there, you know, like in the afternoon and at the end, what was left over on their table, they would sell at a low cost to the store. Um, so it just made it easier for the store to, it kind of solve some of that sourcing issue and has addressed some of his hesitancy around um, the idea of selling produce. All right, well, um our next question comes in from Rick, and I think it'll be our last one. Um, so when working with large chains like, like the Walgreens, did you find success going to individual store managers, or did you go to the regional and corporate offices? Um, we started with the store manager. So the survey that I mentioned earlier that the residents put together, um, that was actually, um, they, they took it to the Walgreens. Um, in, and he didn't have... He had to check in with he had to check in with his district manager. Um, but other than that, we worked one on one with him. When we expanded the program to work with some of the other Walgreens, we actually worked with um, the distributor that was sourcing the produce to make those connections, um, because that was um, you know, something that they were used to working with vendors, and our project was just so new and different. Um, and that's how we actually built the relationship. And he's the one who worked with the district manager. Um, and then it was um, really up to the, you know, the we did outreach. You know, a flyer was sent to all the, the Walgreens stores in that part of the county that we were working in. And it was really up to the store managers then to um, voice interest. At the corporate level, they do have a kind of like a social responsibility um, that, you know, each store needs to, um, you know, do something over the year where they're working with the community. And so that um, was the motivation for some of these stores. But uh, it, 
kind of check that box off. <laughs> but um, I think each chain is going to be different, so you need to spend a little bit of time getting an understanding of um, what that chain, um, how it functions. It really, our building the relationship with the store manager is what gave us a better understanding of how that um, chain um, functions and then allowed us to expand to um, the other stores. Great. Um, so I think that's it for today. And I uh, just want to thank um, Jill and Kara for a great presentation. And um, for the attendees who are still with us, I'm going to go over a few reminders in a moment about how to log your CM credits for attending today's event. Um, but if we didn't get to your question or you have something you want to follow up on, you can always reach Jill and Kara at their email addresses right, right here. So hopefully you've had a chance to, to jot them down. And uh, I will um, go ahead and switch over to my screen, and I'll um, let you uh, let you guys go. And thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, well, for those of the um, attendees who are still with us, um, to log your CM credits for attending today's event, go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, May 4th, and then select today's webcast, which is the new markets model, making a case for healthy retail strategies. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. And also, we are recording today's session, so you will be able to find a recording of this webcast along with a PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. And this does conclude today's session, and I want to thank everyone again for attending. <laughs>